At its height, at least 30,000 people were living in Dawson City, the town set up on the Klondike River in the Yukon Territory in Canada, ground zero for one of the most frantic gold rushes in history. The city was hastily built, so it was not intended to hold that many people. Sewage systems were not introduced until 1899, after the Klondike Gold Rush was officially over, leaving the prospectors to suffer from various diseases, including typhoid and dysentery, in their quest for gold. Most people know the famous gold rushes that sent people west across America in search of sudden riches. While a few people were lucky, most had to struggle to survive in lawless, unhygienic sites in the hope of getting a few pieces of gold. One of the last and most frantic gold rushes in North American history occurred around the Klondike River in the Yukon Territory in Canada. Although this gold rush did not happen in the United States, it still significantly impacted the whole continent, mainly as the United States had recently acquired Alaska, located close by. The Klondike Gold Rush showed the world that people were still looking for easy wealth, and their pursuit of it was powerful enough to change the course of nations. It's time to look into one of the last gold rushes to see how the Klondike Gold Rush continues to impact North America today. What led to the Klondike Gold Rush? People knew there was gold in the Yukon area long before American prospectors began exploring it. However, they had not seriously pursued it. For the native people in the region, gold was not a valued commodity. Many tribes traded using copper nuggets, but gold did not interest them. The area's gold reserves remained unexplored, even when the Hudson's Bay Company and the Russians arrived. They focused on fur trading instead of chasing after rumors of gold. The fur trading was profitable enough to keep the explorers uninterested in verifying the legends. Of course, this did not keep the prospectors away forever. They began arriving in the latter half of the 1800s, reaching the Yukon Valley between 1870 and 1890. They opened up several routes and founded mining camps and towns. One of the most well-known was Circle City, a town so busy it was known as the Paris of Alaska. It peaked in 1896. By this point, a few prospectors had found gold along the Yukon River, including Ed Shifflin in 1883. However, the prospectors did not find gold in the Yukon River only. They also found it in the 40 Mile and the Klondike in 1886. Even this discovery was not enough to start the rush. That did not come until August 1896, when prospectors finally struck large gold deposits in the Klondike River. On August 16, 1896, a few prospectors decided to try their luck on Rabbit Creek, a tributary of the Klondike River. Prospectors George Carmack, Skookum Jim, and Tagus Charlie were following the advice of a Canadian prospector named Robert Henderson as they explored but historians are not clear which of the three men actually first discovered the gold. George Carmack became the official discoverer, but the other two men were concerned the authorities wouldn't recognize their claims because they were Native Americans. Regardless, the men found a large quantity of gold, and Carmack quickly secured four claims, or strips of land that could be mined legally by the owner, the next day. Carmack took two claims and gave one each to Jim and Charlie. News of their find quickly spread and by the end of August, Rabbit Creek was teeming with prospectors. Then, another prospector began exploring a creek that fed Rabbit Creek, later named El Dorado Creek, and discovered an even richer supply of gold. At this point, people started rushing to the area. Miners sold claims amongst themselves and to speculators for increasing amounts of money. When the news reached Circle City in Alaska, the town became a ghost town, even though they did not hear about it until winter. The prospectors there set out on dog sleds, eager to stake a claim before all the good claims had been secured. The gold rush around the Klondike River was a local phenomenon for a few months. Travel in the winter in that part of Canada was extremely difficult. Although the Canadian government knew about the sudden uptick in prospectors, they did not pay much attention to it. Everything changed in June 1897, when the first boats left the Yukon carrying the newly mined gold and the shocking story of this windfall. Soon, prospectors across North America were headed to the Klondike River, eager to get lucky in the last great gold rush. What was life like during the Klondike Gold Rush? The height of the Klondike Gold Rush lasted from the summer of 1897 to the summer of 1898, as about 100,000 people stampeded up to the Klondike River. They were spurred on by the recent economic recessions, 
and the promise of incredible wealth. Some cities also saw opportunities and established themselves as supply centers or trade posts. Between 60 and 80 percent of the prospectors were American or recent American immigrants, many of whom resigned from their jobs to try their luck. Of the 100,000 people who set out for the Klondike Gold Rush, only 30,000 to 40,000 people arrived. Some of this can be attributed to the difficulty in reaching the Klondike River. The only way to reach it was via the Yukon River. Travel was generally tricky, and winters were long and cold. Some prospectors sailed to the site, using ocean and river boats to arrive quickly, although that option was expensive. Other prospectors followed trails on land, using tent camps along the way to eat, sleep, or prepare for impasses like icy lakes. The trails were not intended for this much traffic, and many became too muddy or icy to cross safely. Prospectors also had to worry about avalanches, one of which killed more than 60 people in April 1898. If they survived this far, prospectors often sailed the last few miles down the Yukon River, but the way was fraught with dangers there too. The little boats they used were often overloaded, and many sank. Of the 30,000 to 40,000 people who finally arrived at the Klondike River and settled in Dawson City, only between 15,000 and 20,000 of them became prospectors. Even with these reduced numbers, only about 4,000 of them found gold, and only a few of those people found enough to become rich. By the time the first prospectors in the Stampede arrived, almost all of the best claims at the creeks had already been taken by longtime miners in the region. Gold was unevenly distributed across the region lying along riversides and in the hills. Prospectors had to be fast and get lucky to find a substantial ore deposit, so there were several minor rushes in the Klondike region as the miners found new ore deposits. Mining was an expensive investment, and the claim a prospector took wasn't guaranteed to have gold. Prospectors who were less well-funded or less lucky could quickly find themselves with nothing. Some sold their equipment and left but others took jobs in Dawson or as hired workers for wealthy prospectors. Some people traveled to Dawson City specifically to work in the town. Lucky prospectors were notorious spendthrifts, so business people would establish dancing and gambling halls in the boom towns to draw in the prospectors' newly acquired wealth. Sadly, with all the wealth came increased criminal activity, especially in boom towns like Skagway. Boom towns were built to make a profit off the incoming prospectors, which they achieved by selling goods and alcohol and even engaging in prostitution, robbery, and scams. These places appeared along several routes to the Klondike River, so a prospective prospector had to be on his guard long before finding gold. Dawson City was more lawful than other boom towns, partially because Canadian law enforcement had a more permanent presence and kept a firm handle on enforcing the law. The city still had gambling and prostitution, but it had limited numbers of murders and robberies. Dawson City, in particular, became known for its entertainment, and wealthy prospectors were expected to spend quite a lot of money on their nights out on the town, whether gambling or enjoying a show. The impressive dance halls and opera houses brought famous singers and entertaining acts. While the town may seem like it had been there for a long time, it was founded early in the Klondike Gold Rush and quickly grew to over 30,000 people by 1898. The buildings were made of wood and hastily constructed, which made them susceptible to fires. The city had no paved streets, running water, or sewage system. It was muddy in the spring and smelly in the summer, but their biggest problem actually centered around their remote location. The winter of 1897 was brutal. When the rivers iced over, Dawson City could not get supplies in reliably. Some prospectors evacuated to Fort Yukon, while others attempted to make do. Prices soared, especially since access to supplies like salt and butter fluctuated. The prospectors battled scurvy and cold temperatures. Even though the prospectors fought long and hard during the Klondike Gold Rush, many did not come away with great wealth. Instead, the Klondike Gold Rush ended as many other gold rushes had. The wealthy few took their new riches, and the surviving unlucky prospectors either went home or sent out in hopes of getting lucky on the next round of prospecting elsewhere. Many of those unlucky prospectors left in the summer of 1898. Dawson City also began to change in 1898, moving from a rough city for the lucky to a more sophisticated and sedate town, which did not generally appeal to prospectors. Then, in August 1898, 
Word reached the people on the Klondike River that gold had been found elsewhere in Alaska and Canada. Many people set out in search of the next gold rush, leading to the sudden ending of the Klondike Gold Rush. What were some of the impacts of the Klondike Gold Rush? For many prospectors, the Klondike Gold Rush did not leave them better off. Many lost money. Even those who had fortunes did not usually have the self-control or money sense to sustain them. They lost their fortunes in drink or land speculation, serving as a sad reminder that simply having money is not the secret to happiness. However, a few people did find success and managed to hold on to it, including Martha Black, who ran a successful business in Dawson City and went on to become elected to Yukon Parliament. Kate Rockwell, another successful woman involved in the gold rush, found fame as a dancer and vaudeville star. The gold rush was also not kind to the Native Americans in the area. While some achieved short-term wealth by acting as guides or selling supplies to prospectors, the mining left significant environmental damage. Their traditional hunting and fishing grounds were destroyed, and the prospectors left contaminated water and illnesses such as smallpox. The Native American population dropped significantly. Many of the boom towns vanished after the gold rush, although Dawson City was one of the ones that survived. Its population has significantly decreased since 1898. In the 2021 census, the population was 1,577 people, far from the 30,000. The city still mines gold, but supplements its economy with the tourism industry, demonstrating how the Klondike Gold Rush impacted the environment and shaped the gold production industry. The Klondike Gold Rush was one of the last major gold rushes in North American history, and it held many similar characteristics to prior stampedes. People came from many miles away to try their hand at finding their fortune. Conditions were squalid, many people were unlucky, and often those who were lucky lost their wealth almost as soon as they gained it. Yet, the Klondike Gold Rush reminds the world how far people are willing to go for the chance at a better life. The promise of easy money continues to call, and the Klondike Gold Rush reminds us that easy money is rarely easy to get and never guaranteed. How would you like to get a deeper understanding of history, impress your friends, and predict the future more accurately based on past events? If this sounds like something you might be into, then check out the brand new Captivating History Book Club by clicking the first link in the description. To learn more about the Klondike Gold Rush, check out our book, The Klondike Gold Rush, a captivating guide to the major migration of gold miners to Yukon and its impact on the history of Canada and the United States of America. It's available as an ebook, paperback, and audiobook. If you enjoyed the video, please hit the like button and subscribe for more videos like this.